I try as much as possible to have people asking questions or interacting because this is one of those sessions that you may have alternative views on what a vanity metric is and it's always nice for other people in the room to actually be able to get that level of understanding as well. So please, if you have questions or anything, put your hands up and speak. Um, it will be much better and much more beneficial for everyone at that time. So my name's Paul Stack. Um, as of uh, a few weeks ago, I'm a jobless bum. So I, um, I am enjoying my fun employment and um, it's why I'm here for a whole week, having a nice vacation as part of the conference. Um, I'm an infrastructure guy. I have been for a long time now. Um, predominantly in the cloud. I don't really like managing physical infrastructure anymore because it's 2019 and I actually just don't like, like SSH and all the machines. And I've been talking about DevOps topics for a long time, maybe eight or nine years now, and that's, it's, it's become a real passion of mine. It really has. Now, can anybody tell me what a vanity metric is? Please. Nobody. Is anybody awake? Excellent. Is everyone looking forward to beers? Yes. Okay. So we'll try and get finished up quite early so everyone actually can go and have beers. So a vanity metric is a metric that makes us look good to other people, but it doesn't actually give us any real indication to define performance. Now, that's a lot of words. Okay. A perfect example of a vanity metric is this. Twitter followers, Instagram followers, all of this stuff, right? We feel wonderful about ourselves when we hit like, if you're on Instagram, you hit like 100 likes on your Instagram picture. What does it mean? It means nothing. It could be a bot, it could be 100 bots. You could have said something that's particular niche to a specific hashtag, anything, okay? If you look at your numbers on social media, and you actively track your numbers in social media, you are guilty of falling into the vanity metric trap. I did this for so many years. I was obsessed by my Twitter numbers. I was really obsessed by them. And I think I remember maybe 10 years ago, and I'm not gonna name the speaker because I don't think they believe the same thing anymore. I was in a talk and they said that they actually keep their metrics on Twitter, that they, they have um, usually 10 times more followers than they do follow people. So for example, if they follow 2,000 people, or excuse me, if they have 2,000 followers and all of a sudden they're following 205 people, they will go and unfollow five people so they keep it to the 10 times, okay? It's a ridiculous metric. I really, I need to actually ask that person again that that's the case. So are all metrics bad, okay? The answer is no, of course, but all metrics can actually be construed in a vanity way. You just have to think about what that vanity is. Let's think of the following scenario. Okay. Company creates a brand new application, an iOS application, Android application, whatever it is you want. Okay. The PR team created an email and it's created and sent out to 100,000 people. Okay. You have 100,000 people arrived on the landing page for the application. Okay. You actually have 100,000 people arriving on the application. Is that measurement of 100,000 page views a real metric or a vanity metric? And why? And if you can give me a nice answer for this, I promise I will buy you a beer. And that never happens. Oh, oh, wait, I <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for me it'd be bad because it means no one's bought anything yet. Uh, no one's actually shown any interest in my product other than clicked on a link. And that would be then automated or in fact could just be random. And it may not even have come necessarily from that email. So yeah, for me it's vanity. It's exactly correct. Go on. I'm going to say, I'm going to say, go on. I'm going to say it's real because it depends on your perspective. The marketing team totally did their job in this situation, right? Also they wrote this fucking correct. amazing email. Especially if you say, I mean, I told you like, make it up, but if you send out 100,000 emails, you get 100,000 clicks. <laughs> <laughs> like absolutely true. And this is exactly the correct thing. Okay, I'll buy you both a beer. Right? Yeah, right. beer. Two beers. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get half a beer. Each. You can both have a rattler, okay? But what is what's being said is hundred percent correct, okay? Because the metric for the individual person, the individual team is what is actionable. It's not it, across in itself without any context to it, it's a vanity metric. Okay? It means zero. But when you're in terms of a development team and you're trying to get application downloads, it doesn't tell you anything about application downloads. But if you're in a PR team and you've sent out and you get a 100% hit rate, 
you're pretty awesome at what you do. Let's think of it in a different way. You're probably cheating. You're probably <laughs> cheating. <laughs> it's also very true as well, like really, of course. Let's think of it a different way, okay? The, app, the company creates the application, PR email is sent, they get 100,000 people. We can measure the rate of conversion from page view to application downloads, and that's a much more targeted metric for the people that are actually doing it, okay? Now, we're all guilty in companies that don't do this last part, okay? I worked for a specific company up until, I'm gonna say within the past five years, I've worked at a lot of companies in the past five years, so it's okay, you can't find out who it is. And they have absolutely no idea how many people download their binaries, none. Like, and it's stupid. It's absolutely stupid because you have to go to a specific URL, you have to actually double get it, or you have to um, use curl or um, uh, brew or cask or anything like this, and they do not know how many application downloads they have. So when we ask the question, how many people use X product, they're like, it's like, so not only that, you can't tell us how many people use X version of the product, and they're like, it's like so how can we ever deprecate older versions? How can we kill off old versions of APIs and stuff? This is bad, of course, this is extremely bad. You sometimes probably look at companies that have this type. This is a conversion funnel. Okay, a conversion funnel will actually be able to target and drill down into individual specific metrics as they go through. So like visitors create bounces, specific browsers, like waivers, late waivers, and then you can get the whole way down into individual um, conversions. Okay. I, I did, I can actually say, um, I worked for opentable.com, and opentable were absolutely wonderful at this. Okay, their marketing team and their PR team, they understood exactly the seasonal trends, they understood exactly the times of day that people were able to convert different metrics, and they could understand at any minute in time what was going to happen on the site. Of course, any adverse outages like power outages or data center outages would affect it, but the funnels, if they took day on day, week on week, year on year, were almost identical for all of the different times. Now, as a development team, it was an absolute dream for us because we could scale up and scale down based on what they knew from the, com from the conversion funnels. So that's not a vanity metric. This to me is a real targeted metric that I really understand what is going on in my system at any one point in time. So how can I identify if a metric is measured in vain? Okay. I'm going to probably say some things that people don't like, okay? I apologize in advance. I'm a grumpy old man. I've had a few cocktails already, because I always do, because it's Spain. So, please don't take anything I say as bad, okay? This is from my own personal experience from companies I've worked at, and from companies who do things in a, I'm going to say the word unique way of, of, uh, of, of working, okay? So, the first one, there's three basic rules, okay? Can I make a business decision based on this metric? Let's go back to thinking about Instagram followers, just because it's a very easy thing for people to understand, okay? Let's pretend I'm one of those cool social influencers, right, that sell loads of things and do loads of things and show off loads of videos. I, don't, I think it's rubbish. If you are, I'm sorry, that's not what I meant. If that's your job, great. So, as a, as a social influencer, one of my goals is followers, okay? Because the more people that see the content I do, the more people I can influence, okay? If you were in the, the I, don't know, I can't remember the, the website, but you used to have clout. Does anyone remember the website, the social media website, where you had clout based on like tweets and stuff like that? Yeah, it's, in, it's completely unmemorable because it means nothing, right? Like honestly. So let's go back to that. If I have one million followers, does that mean I'm good at what I do? Anybody? Oh, as a social influencer, does it mean I'm good at what I do? If I have one million, one M on my Instagram profile, is that good or bad? You good? Who are they? Good question. So what do we want? We want more context based on it, okay? Very good. So I have one million people who are as young and trendy as me, of course, and follow me and seeing all the different brands that I promote. Does that mean I'm good or bad at what I do? Okay, I'll ask you a different question. How can I guarantee all those one million followers see every one of my posts and actually click through to every one of my posts? 
the one million means nothing without a conversion or an engagement metric based off the back of it. It really, unfortunately, means nothing. Okay. Number two, can I intentionally repeat this result? Back to Instagram again. If my goal is followers, and I want to get followers, and I close my Instagram account tomorrow and reopen it, can I easily get 100 or a million followers again? I'll give you a hint. You can buy 100,000 Instagram followers for $40. So yes is the answer, okay? You can spend a little bit of money and you can inflate that number because it doesn't really mean anything and it doesn't really give you any indication of what the hell's going on. So you can intentionally kill a metric and if you can, therefore it's a vanity metric. We can go back to the application downloads. 100,000 people get an email and there's 100,000 um, page views based off the back of that. Is that a bot? Has it gone to a bot? Has somebody written a page crawler that like randomly like crawls it every 15, 20 seconds or whatever? Does it mean there's 100,000 unique page views? So 100,000 page views in itself is nothing. But if it's unique, then that's a very good job. Your marketing department has really done their job. So everything is around context, especially when it comes to metrics. Number three. Is the data a real reflection of the truth? Hundred, uh, a million Instagram followers doesn't mean that companies are going to sell a million products. They are going to sell a very small percentage, if any, based off the back of what I promote. It doesn't really matter. And therefore, because it doesn't really matter, saying that I have one million Instagram followers and I'm brilliant at what I do is not 100% correct. And this is the very important part. Now, it's really important to say external factors can actually change a lot of this. In January 2018, Facebook actually changed their algorithm for how they present uh, news in your feed. Okay? In 2018, they changed the algorithm to prefer local news sources over international news sources. And therefore, all of a sudden, all of these pages for local news sources their traffic went from here to here, and the internationals went from here to here. Now, of course, they didn't know that. Facebook didn't announce it in advance. They announced it like three or four months later because they were tinkering with the old earth and doing things like this. But some of the local news stations were getting information like, holy crap, we're really good at what we do. Look, look, look. We've gone from like 5% engagement to like 85% engagement, and they're like sitting there like, maybe we should get new salaries and, and looking after themselves. But of course, it's not their fault because they didn't understand why the traffic had changed. So that external source was extremely important for what they're actually trying to achieve. And if we can find that an external source can change things so drastically without giving us the context to understand why or what it does and what its benefit has, it's more than likely a vanity metric, unfortunately. I'm sorry to say it. Okay? Don't, you know, don't take it a if your news percentage goes from 5% to 85% of your page views, that you're not doing a good job. Of course you're still doing good work, but you can't just sit back and go, I'm done. Like I can just sit here now and just coast and let the money roll in. It's not the way it works. We can apply these questions to any single measurement and it will help us decide if it's an important measurement or not. Now, I am going to apologize in advance, there's probably, as I say, things in here that people care about, but I'm just going to tell you that it's rubbish, like, and I'm sorry, if you still believe that it's great for what you do, wonderful. These are things that I have learned throughout the years that I need to not care anymore about, okay, and some of them are a little bit controversial, and, we'll, and then we'll get to, like, some of my favorites, okay, some where I really hate what companies do, okay, number one, Twitter followers, sorry, what does it matter? Like really, I know people on Twitter now who delete every single one of their tweets every week, okay, because they don't really care anymore. Number two, blog page views. I wrote a, um, wrote a blog post like two weeks ago on running Nomad in production, using cockro or running Cockroach at DB in production using Nomad, and um, I had something stupid like 66,000 page views in a day, right? And I was looking at it going, Jesus, that's like weird. Cloud front issue. <laughs> CloudFront was killing my website because it was continually checking if it was alive because I didn't have an exclusion set up for one of the pages. 
So all these requests were coming in, I'm looking at a Google Analytics, well, what the hell is going on? It means nothing, what does it matter? Fair enough, some people write blog posts because they're awesome and they want to put information out there. I mostly write blog posts because I'm forgetful and I want to use that same code at a different company. And therefore, I can't steal the code. I cannot steal the code because it's intellectual property, so I anonymize the code and I post it on my blog. If there's any prospective employers listening, that's not what I do, really. <laughs> Get honest with One of my favorites, green marks at the end of a conference talk. Okay, I, I, I wish it wasn't recorded because then I actually could swear and it would be much funnier. I've been to some conferences, okay, where I give talks that are sometimes not as popular as other talks. Okay, so you go to a bigger ASP.NET conference and you have huge talks around like the new versions of C-sharp, the new versions of .NET, where you'll get like a thousand people in the room, and therefore the number of greens that people get automatically is much higher than a stupid little rant like this. Okay, that's just the way it works. And of course then conferences rank people on a leaderboard. It's like way to kill people's motivation. Like really, you got two greens, but there was only two people in your room. That's 100% green, that's a much better metric then there's a thousand people in your room, but you've got 63. So therefore, you have 60 green more than this person. Okay. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish metric. Please, if you're involved in a conference, do not do that. I believe that it's a very bad way of, of promoting new speakers to get involved because it means that they're um, very well. But by the way, we can vote on this session. <laughs> it's just important to say. Yeah. Uh, number of GitHub commits. Where do I even talk about this one? Okay, there's a guy who tweeted, and he's been in a company for 2,695 days, the same company. Okay, he then followed up by saying, in that 2,695 days, I think that's about eight years, or something like that, if I can approximate it. Okay, he made 6,040 commits to the company's code base, and he created 1,114 1, PRs. Okay, now I did a little bit of math on that. And I'm sitting there thinking, does he only work like one hour a week? Because like this year alone, I think I have somewhere in the region of 5,000 GitHub commits. What does a number of commits mean? Like I could push 500 commits, it says fix up test, fix up test, spell a mistake, spell a mistake, you know, um, change read me. And, and, and it doesn't really mean anything. It's not really adding anything to your product. So what does it matter in the number of commits you have? Like great, it's a metric. I'm going to show you a website. Um, let's make sure I don't have anything open on my computer. I shouldn't have. Like, really? Oh, wow. There we go. Arrangement, mirror. Quickly close that tab. There is a website called commits.top. Okay, and commits.top will actually. Yeah, it will take the most active GitHub users in the world and it will actually rank them based on the number of commits. Now, this person, you may not be able to see it, has 12,236 commits. Now, let's just go and have a look. I'm not saying this person's doing something wrong, okay? It's really not. I am such a grumpy old man when it comes to things like this, I'm sorry, okay? Now, that just looks too perfect a commit graph for me. Like, this, firstly, this person doesn't take vacation which is a terrible thing, okay? <laughs> like, he's taken maybe one, two, three, four, maybe 20 days off in an entire year, okay? Don't let yourself get dragged into this type of metric. It's extremely, extremely bad, and if you do get dragged into this type of metric, you're only going to make yourself go crazy. A very good friend of mine, and he won't mind me telling, Rob Ashton, Rob actually, um, had a mission that he would create at least one GitHub pull request or um, commit a day for an entire year. Okay, and I remember drinking with him in bars in Krakow in Poland, and at four o'clock in the morning he was pulling his laptop out just so he could make a GitHub commit so he could keep that run going. So you can get very much caught up on it. You speak to him about it now, he's like, "I was young and stupid." That's exactly what he, his words were. So it doesn't really matter. Okay, next one. The number of GitHub issues and PRs there are. We'll come back to this one actually later because this is a very interesting one. Okay, build times. Oh, Jesus Christ. Like, really. Fair enough, if your build takes 30 minutes, you probably have a little work in it. Okay, we, 
previous company I just left before I became a jobless bum. We had build times of 15 minutes, okay, which was pretty slow. We got those build times down to 40 seconds because we changed to a different build system called Please, which is based on, uh, it's, it'll come back to me. It's based on a build system that does hermetic builds, so it only understands what needs to change and when it actually needs to rebuild a binary. Okay, and um, we got it down to 40 seconds. It drifted to 45 seconds, and one of the developers was like, our build times are up again. I'm like, you have way too much time in your hands if you're worried about five seconds. Like, really? I'm at the point now where it takes me more than five seconds to get off my chair. <laughs> so they can wait the extra five seconds if they really want. Okay? Number of builds per day. Honestly, people do use this. People actually use this. Now let's think about number of builds per day. Can you dramatically increase that number? Yes, because you can click a button that says build, 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 build. In any CI system, you can trigger a build whenever you want. Of course, if it's based on code, that's a different thing. But you can actively do it yourself without the CI system detecting it and doing it. So don't use it. Jesus, please do not use it. Okay. The number of GitHub stars and forks. Who cares about the number of forks they have in a project? Be honest with me. Anybody? I'm still getting notifications for GitHub projects I was following nine years ago. Because I forked it when I was doing a completely different language stack, when I wasn't in operations or infrastructure, when I was back doing C Sharp. And I'm like starring all these different uh, repositories. And I'm still getting the notifications for them. And I'm having to find them and go through them and unstar them and unfork them and unwatch them and delete my forks. It doesn't matter, right? Fair enough, it might give you an indication if it's a popular project. And that's okay, but use it as an indication rather than a, I need to get my project to a million forks. Like really, if that's a personal goal, great. But don't let it tell you that that's a successful product. It really doesn't mean a successful product. I could cough and go, <coughs> MongoDB. Number of application downloads. Yes, in itself, it's a wonderful metric. Wonderful metric. But what's the conversion of those downloads? For every one download, does it take five million people to view the website or view the project in order to do? In itself, it's just a number. It's really just a number. It doesn't mean anything. Now we get into some very good ones. Story points. This person could sell sand to people who live on a beach because story points is one of those things in all the years I've been doing IT, I never understood what it means. Really never understood it. What you do is in a small period of time, you estimate that you are going to take on 10, 20, 30 story points. Okay, And then we sit down and we think, hmm, how do we break this out, this system down into story points? And we just go, for, for, anyone play estimation poker? Like really? We're literally just taking five cards and throwing them out there and going, that's eh, it's, and I've used infinity like a hundred times. Like because I'm going, I have no idea. No idea what it means? Infinity, it'll be perfect. I'll just take forever to do it. Story points, for God's sake, is madness. And then not only that, we have meetings to um, understand the accuracy of our planning. It's like, Jesus, how many people love meetings? Anybody put your hand up, I know you're lying. I totally know you're lying. Okay? But we actually sit in a room and we think, how well did we do about our estimations? Rather than going, what can we do a little bit better and deliver it faster to our users, rather than getting 20 people in a room for two hours or whatever it is in order to take it. Meetings themselves are just a terrible thing in IT. I'm in a very fortunate position that I, the, the team I will be working for, potentially, I'm 10 hours ahead of them, okay? I don't need to do meetings, okay? Working remote is brilliant. Working remote on a different continent is even better. And I mean, it really will level up your understanding of why meetings are bad. I think in the last team, I was in the same, and I had two 20-minute meetings a week. 
and it was brilliant. I didn't waste any time because meetings, unfortunately, are a waste of time. First thing we do, six or seven of us will get in a room with our laptops and we'll read our own emails or we'll tweet or we'll pretend that we're taking notes and after 20 minutes we'll drift off in the space and we'll think, why are we here again? What was this meeting about? And then what's even better is people have meetings in order to prepare for meetings. Like how stupid is that? That's even worse. Sorry if you do, but that's just, that's just my personal opinion. As I said, I'm a ranty old man. Cost of infrastructure. Um, anybody in here have um, a development environment or a, um, a testing environment that's exactly the same as production? Yeah. And why is it that we're usually told that that's the case? One, our production infrastructure is so vast that we wouldn't be able to recreate it on our local development machines. Fair, okay, absolutely fair point, really. Two, it's so vast that it would cost us a lot of money in order to keep all these different levels of environment. Hmm, hmm, let's think about that one. Or number three, which is actually the most valid reason, we have PII data, we can't replicate the same production down, so therefore it would only ever be a subset of what's in production. That's the perfect answer. If a company gives me that answer, I'm crazy happy about that. If a company tells me it's because our production infrastructure is so big that we wouldn't be able to replicate it in an environment, I'll be like, how much is it going to cost if we keep it up for one hour a day? If you're in the cloud, like, you can spin it up and you can spin it back down very, very easily. There are tools that can do it, and if you need a consultant, I will help you. <laughs> but in actual fairness, it's like even companies like Amazon, for example, have changed RDS to per minute billing. Okay, in order, in order for people to keep their environments alive, that they can stop them, save money when they need to, and bring it back up. This is not a difficult scenario anymore. It's 2019. The tooling out there is amazing in order to help you do this. It really is. So the cost of infrastructure shouldn't be a problem. In the same respect as the cost of a very good developer laptop should also not be a problem. If you have a very interesting story. I have to go into a side line here. Very interesting story. I was doing some consultancy work for a company in Las Vegas. Okay. And they had four Java applications. Okay. Anybody who knows about Java applications, Java applications have like usually heap associated with them and you have to give it a certain amount of RAM in order for the application to run. These four applications had four gig of heap each, okay, is what they needed in order to successfully run. Now this company brought me in and I didn't realize that part of the, it's my own fault for being stupid, I, part of the, the statement of work was that I had to dockerize these Java applications. Okay, great, wonderful. So they created this infrastructure in advance for me that I would uh, create um, um, ECS, Amazon Elastic um, Container Solution, okay? And um, they were like, so we've given you a cluster of three machines. I'm like, okay. And each machine has four gig of RAM. I'm like, count it. Go, are we sure? That's enough? And they're like, yeah, it's Docker. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And they're like, well, Docker, you can take a server and you can split it up much smaller. Like, yeah, but if you've got a four gig application, it's still four gig in Docker. I'm like, no, no, that's not how Docker works. And I'm like, <laughs> like really? And they did it because they wanted to cheap up. Because each application server had its own server before, so they wanted to move from 16 servers to three servers and store their Docker containers, and then it would be much cheaper. Needlessly say, we parted ways very soon. Cost of travel, I'm coming back to this one. This is amazing. Um, developer productivity. Okay. If your developers need a license of a tool that will help them be more productive, give them the 100 bucks or the 200 bucks or the 1,000 bucks, whatever it is, in order to make them more productive. People did so many ca cost calculations based on things like ReSharper, okay, JetBrains ReSharper, where Keystrokes and Visual Studio was cut down so much, they said that by making something like 100,000 keystrokes, in a year, they actually justified the cost of a single license of ReSharper, right? Because it saved them time based on, again, those people have too much time in their hands. But it's a case of it's never going to bankrupt your, it may not bankrupt your company to give them what they need in order to do their job. And if it's around productivity for developers, developers will be insanely happy 
by getting the tool that they want and therefore they'll feel that you're trying to support them in their role. We'll come back to these three very soon. Ah, code coverage. Code, code, code coverage. Ah, I don't even know what to say about this one. Do it. Do it? Why? Do it. So code coverage to me means zero. Okay? Because does that mean it's code coverage based on unit test or is it code coverage based on acceptance test or so on and so forth? Okay? Personally speaking, personally speaking, if you go for 100% code coverage, wonderful. Not a problem for me. Personally speaking, I would rather spend the time making the application better and understanding how the application works than write individual stupid unit tests for different things like getters and setters. Okay? And unfortunately, I did work in an environment where that was so important to me that I strived for the 100%. Another one based off the back of that is cyclomatic complexity. Okay? And there are tools out there that will measure the cyclomatic complexity of your code. Because if you go if, 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 you need five times x the amount of unit tests you would need because of the other cyclomatic complexity of like five, for example. It doesn't matter. Spend the time making the application better for your users. And if you have time later, you can actually add some tests as you go. I'm not saying do not test. I'm really not saying do not test. It's extremely important to test because if you don't test, you're dead in the water because your users will find things that you didn't even know existed in your system. But spend the time doing end-to-end -end testing rather than individual functions in my opinion. Now, of course, there are pieces of your code that are so complex and that are so business critical that they need time focused for those unit tests. Spend it there, okay? Spend it there. I once was told that a way to think about testing a system was to think of insurance premiums, okay? Now this is a very interesting way of thinking about testing. Okay? So if you wanted everything to be tested and everything to be 100% covered, that premium was going to be expensive because it took a long time to do. Okay? But if there were areas of your system that you felt that there were a little bit of risk could be enabled in order to allow you to move faster, you would pay the equivalent of like you know, your premium will be lower, but your excess will be higher. So you would have to be able to fix it as you went. And this was very interesting for me because I started thinking about where's the main core of my system? What are the things within the system that I need to end-to-end -end test and spend my time on? And what can I just not worry about right now? Okay. Well, there were some very easy things like, I'll go back to the open table website, for example. The reservation path, ridiculously, ridiculously uh, important to like, test because if you can't make reservations, the company don't make money. It's that simple. Secondly, the next thing after that was the uh, re registration account login because if you can't log into your account, people can't make registrations. Like, ridiculously um, difficult to do. And then we started to identify different areas in the system like some of the help pages. Okay, some of the help pages. Not all of the help pages, because some of them are very important related to the booking path. Things like, you know, diner awareness, and like all of these different <coughs> things that are happening and within the company themselves. And we were like, we don't need to test that, let's take that out, let's not worry about it. And we actually got our testing time much, much, much lower based on the fact that we actually identified areas of the system in which we could test. When we did that, our code coverage plummeted because it wasn't important to us. The end-to-end -end test around those main functionalities in the site was the most important pieces that we required, and that was the ones that we cared about the coverage. So it's really important that that's the case. And then believe it or not, this still happens in the world. Lines of code per day. People are judged on lines of code per day still in the world. We still have these meritocracy style companies where if you're not writing a lot of code, then you're not delivering for the company. And it tends to happen in countries where like a lot of work is outsourced and like, you know, there's like development farms, if you think of it like that. And 
It's like some areas, and I know like Belarus, for example, has a, has a lot of developer community that are crazy smart, but some of the companies in London that are actually contracting them actually get them to like commit to a certain level of lines of code. So, of course, in a language like Go, which I write in, they have linters that remove all the empty spaces and remove all the code. So I would be crucified in the fact that I wouldn't be able to make that lines per code. And then you have like languages that have pattern matching in which you can do everything in like, um, you know, a much more simple, much more um, structured way rather than, you know, boilerplate code. And that it's, it's a boilerplate code dream, it really is. Any, does anybody else have any examples that I miss any? People must have their favorites. You can say, I don't mind. And if you think this is wrong, please tell me as well, because it's really important too. As I said, I, I am a grumpy old man, but I want to be told. I think hours uh, that your butt is in a seat. Oh, amazing. <laughs> hours that your ass is in a seat. Oh my God, that's a... I'll take note of that one. It's true. Like, you have companies now that even though you're remote, you have core hours. You ever heard that term before? Well, you must be online between 10 until 5. But then you're remote and you can like work flexibly. Well, no, it means I have to get up at nine o'clock still and I finish at the normal time. I'm lazy, I get up when I want and I, I work when I want. Hours of, hours in a, a seat's amazing. Also, hours build per project. Now in a consultancy, that's of course extremely important. But how, as a consultant, can I actually account for every single hour in a project? Like, do I start a timer when I start writing some code? What happens if I go on Twitter? Should I stop that timer? You know, or is it part of the hour? So it's, it's difficult. It's a really difficult thing. Any, any others? Bugs per lines of codes. Bugs per line of code is interesting one. Why do you think that's a, a, a vanity metric, by the way? Well, because if you uh, refactor, you actually reduce the, line, the amount of lines. Oh, oh, OK, in that respect, OK. I could also argue the other way. Bugs per line of code is a pretty good metric because it means that you're not paying attention, right? But I understand what you're saying about the fact that when you refactor, you, you remove lines of code. It's also a very interesting one as well because I, I think on my GitHub, I actually wrote an application that was a lines of code counter in C Sharp. And I wrote one because I was interested in finding out just how many lines of code our application had. And it was like 1.6 million lines of code. Okay. It was a monolithic application that when you actually like, removed all the white space and stuff like that, it was probably closer to about 800,000. So, you know, but you're right. And we, we could actually like, understand different areas of the code that had more bugs than others, and we had to spend time based on that. But that can actually also be a good metric because if you have one particular piece of the application that is throwing bug, 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 you can actually apportion some developer resource in order to make that better. So, some, so it can be good and it also can be bad. It's why it, it's not, not one of my favorites, which is why I didn't throw it out. Any others? Weaknesses found. Weaknesses found. If you found. chaos engineering with that metric in mind all the time. But what does it mean? I can gain the heck out of that metric. Weaknesses, <laughs> Weaknesses found when you're doing chaos engineering. Yeah. Is this something I need to start putting in some of my talks in order to get consultancy gigs? Absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> but it's true, like, you can gain anything. Uh, just similar to the lines of code per day, um, if you have outsourced QA, you should do that. But if you have outsourced QA, like bugs found, is a similar one, right? Yeah. <laughs> Which one, sir? Google audit performances. Google audit performances. Oh, you just made me a new one. Page speed index. Good or bad? Good or bad? Page speed index. Do you believe it's a good thing or a vanity metric? Oh, of course, I, again, it's one of those things. It depends what your area is, and it depends what part of the application or part of the system you're working with, okay? So if you're like a front-end developer like yourself, page speed is crazy important for you. Otherwise, you're just throwing like tons of JavaScript libraries in there that are just bloating the word. Think of Slack, all right? Um, or Electron apps. Whereas like for me, for example, who couldn't write JavaScript if you like, if I had, my life had to depend on it, my JavaScript is the worst that you will ever see. And I couldn't write it, and therefore the page speed would be shocking. Like, so it's important to some people and not important to others. So, my worst offender. Does anybody want to take a guess at what my worst offender is? Here. Hmm? Tell me yours. <laughs> the Balmer Peak should be in here for sure, right? They really should. 
Okay, my worst offender is cost of travel. Okay, as a remote employee, I am sorry. Okay, I don't want to lose my time or the company's time if I have to go somewhere on their behalf. Time is money for all of us. We all have our own lives outside of work. So I think giving me the ability to do my job while I'm traveling is extremely important to me. I do not want to be traveling on my weekends. If I need to be in an office on a Tuesday morning, let me fly business class on a Monday rather than fly an economy on a Sunday. This happened to me 10 or 12 weeks ago. The cost of the business class flight, I had to be in an office for four days, Tuesday through Friday. The cost of the business class flight from where I live was 2,500 euros, okay? which is not a lot. It's really not a lot. Okay? The cost of an economy flight was 700 euros. The company looked at it and was like 700 euros. Okay? So I was able to show them if I flew on Monday business class, I could work on the plane, sleep when I got there because I had already done all the work that I needed to do in preparation for my meeting, and I would be fresh to go to the office on Tuesday. But if I had to travel in crappy economy class, okay, which I don't really fit in the seats anyway because I'm fat, so therefore, if I had to go economy class, I would have had to fly on Sunday, get my work done on the Monday, and feel jet lagged as hell. Okay? They said no economy class only, so I cancelled the trip when I didn't go. Because it's really important for me that I can get work done when I'm going. It's like I flew to Australia in. October, November, and I did more work on a trip to Australia than I did in my entire day at home sat at my desk because I had no disruptions, I had no Slack messages, I had no phone calls, nothing. It was me, my laptop, and a couple of beers getting stuff done. And it was crazy, crazy, crazy productive. Okay, so cost of travel is amazing. And people use it as an excuse all the time. Now there are very good companies out there that when they have remote, they will actually give people a very good travel budget for one, but two, they will get companies together as a whole development team or a whole company, maybe once, maybe twice per year. Okay. If you're in a remote company and you're not doing that, please speak to your boss that you should do that. Because just because you're remote doesn't mean you need to break your relations with other people. Face-to-face -face time is extremely important. Otherwise, conferences like this would be remote. You wouldn't be able to be here. It would serve no purpose. We were talking yesterday. You actually meet a lot of people at conferences based on the fact that you can have a beer with them and talk about techie things away from individual talks like this. So the same thing happens at work and it's crazy important. Some honorable mentions. Okay. The cost of infrastructure is like really, really, really a bugbear for me. It really is. I was spending maybe $3,000 a month in Packet.net, which is like for physical infrastructure, like as a service type thing. And um, I was told I had to cut that $3,000 because it was too much. And I was like, so what do we use instead? They were like, we can use Docker. I was like, so where does Docker run? Um, we'll like buy some credit on Amazon and we'll run a couple of Docker servers. Okay? So they took from $3,000 a month to $2,000 a month, and it took three days to move everything, okay? And I pointed out, three days, how much does that cost? And they were like, well, it depends what level of developer is moving it. You know, if it's like a senior architect or something like that, then it's, ex it's, it's expensive. You can maybe apportion 3,000 a day, or 1,000 a, a day, and they're like, so it's like 3,000, 2,000, three days, 1,000 a day. Hmm, whose stupid decision was it to make this? They were like, oh, it was my boss. I was like, yeah, sure, it's always the way. Cost of developer productivity. Really, give me the tools that I can deliver and I will do my job and do what I'm actually asked to do. My biggest, biggest, biggest bugbear is when I start a new job and my laptop is not available for me on my first day. Okay? Immediately, you're breaking my trust in what I am joining. Okay? I have seen such happy mediums of people arriving at their desk on their first day and they have like their little uh, welcome packs and their, you know, like their laptops and their cars and stuff like that. Whereas I took a trip to, yeah, I almost said the name of the company there. And I'm, everyone will know who it is if they just like look at what I was talking about like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I had to take a, a, a trip to their London office recently. One, HR didn't even know I was coming. 
they didn't even know. I was like, okay, I can forgive that because I work for the US and I was having to sign out of the UK. Uh, laptop wasn't available. I flew in from Lithuania. I took a flight at 6 a.m. that morning to go to London, to the office, and I had a flight out to Lithuania at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. No laptop ready. When I asked them about it, they were like, what laptop did you order? And I was like, a MacBook. And they were like, we don't deal with MacBooks here. We're Windows users. And I was like, fuck. So forget that, because they posted it to me. It took two weeks. Um, next thing, um, key card was invalidated as soon as I arrived. When I went home and I got the actual work laptop for the work emails, um, VPN wasn't activated. It's like, okay, how do I do that? Oh, you have to come in and file a ticket in person because they have to do it on the machine. I was like, I, I sh warning sign should have happened then. It really should have happened. You give me the tools to do my job and I promise you I will deliver what I've asked, actually asked to do. I'm a, I'm a responsible person. I'm not going to cheat your company and I believe that all companies should treat their employees the same way. Okay? You'll soon figure out if somebody is a hanger on and they're not delivering value for what you're doing. You will really soon deliver that. So tell me what metrics are useful to collect. There's so many. Okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, like, I've just talked about bad things for 30 minutes. And I, trust me, if you have a beer with me later, I'll talk for another 40 minutes at least. But there are like useful ones. Like work in progress is one of my favorites. Okay? Now, I, I actually measure, actively measure work in progress. The reason I actively measure it is because I want to limit it as much as I possibly can. Okay? Now, what I mean by work in progress is if we go back to the days of sprints and scrum, okay, where you know, 20 people in a team could start 500 tasks at the same time and never actually deliver one of the single tasks in the end. I've moved much more onto Lean and Kanban where it's a pull-based system and we try and limit the amount of things that are happening on our system at the same time. Now, we can have measurements based on that because of the fact that the developers that I worked with were very useful in like, creating work in progress pull requests that people could track what was going on and seeing what changes were happening. So work in progress was very important for me and my team because I wanted people to finish what they were doing because context switching is a killer. It's an absolute killer. So finish what you're doing and then start the next thing. Okay? Cycle time and lead time. I almost, I hate JIRA with a passion. I wasn't going to say it, I did. Because JIRA is like a place where issues go to die. Okay? It is one of these backlog systems, unfortunately. It's a great tool. One of these systems is people, if it's misused, they throw issues in and there's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of issues and you'll never understand what's going on. And then eventually you'll see one that was like created 16 years ago by a product manager who no longer works at the company. And the cycle time on that is like ridiculous. This person 16 years ago decided that this was a very good feature and only now you're sitting there thinking, actually that is a good feature, let's implement that. So we try and limit the time taken from an idea to like when we're testing this in production, like cycle time and lead time, okay? Because if it's nice and small, it means that we're not just like light bulb moments and throwing issues in the thing. We're actually reacting based on what users want from our system. And that for us, that for my whole team, this is very important, like crazy important. Okay. Meantime to resolution. If you are not measuring this, please start. Please, 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 please start. From the minute in which a bug was detected and going into your system until the minute the bug has been classed as completed or fixed. And I don't mean when the pull request is merged. Okay, that is a fallacy because code then can take a long time to get into production. I mean when it is guaranteed, based on your metrics, that it is no longer throwing the same errors as it was before in production. Okay? Mean time between failures. This goes back to what you were saying about bugs per line of code. Right? Because if you have a system that's throwing bug, 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 you need to spend some time in that area. Okay? If you have an area of code that the mean time between failures in that code is like 500 days, then it means that A, you know, it's not as mission critical as something that's firing a lot more than that, but you can start to rank the priority of the bugs that come out of there, and you can understand what's going on. So it's a very useful measurement to understand the areas of the system that may need some developer resource applied to them. Application crash rates. Any iOS developers, Android developers, stuff like that? 
Okay. So you got to sort of understand your application crash rates because if every time somebody opens your application it crashes, you got to do something about your application. Okay. If you think that your application is out there doing wonderful and you don't know any metrics that's coming out of the back of it, please spend a little time in order to actually grab those metrics because it will give you an insight into what is happening. Now I said earlier about GitHub issues and pull requests. Now I actually like to measure the issue opening and closing rates because again I want to understand that issues are not just open, triaged and left forever and never fixed. I like to see that more issues are closed than there are being opened. It's, in, it's important for me. The same as well for pull requests. Now, of course, meaningful pull requests that relate back to bugs and so on and so forth, or new features. So being able to measure those is really important for me because then I understand that the system is moving forward, not just stagnating. Two more. Release cycle time. So the time's taken in order to release. Now, given, I promise I'll only keep it for two more minutes. Right? I, I worked, when I was at OpenTable, um, we used to have this scenario where we would work for four weeks per time. Okay? Four week sprints. And then after that, after the four weeks, there was a five week integration time. Right? I'm not joking, five weeks. And the reason it was five weeks is because there was five teams. Now, if there were six teams, it would have been a six-week integration time because it took an entire week for each team to merge their code back into master. An entire week. Okay. Now, of course, that's not brilliant. So therefore, we went from finishing code on week four to the end of integration on week nine. And then QA would start at week nine and go from nine to 13. Now, the cycle time in that was finishing code on week four Nine weeks later, it was then deemed, is this ready for production? Okay, by then, I've already done two more cycles. Okay, so when we started measuring that, our CTO was like, this is ridiculous. Why, we, why are we doing this? And was a new CTO came in and he was like, where are we losing all our time? We drew out the cycle time and he was like, okay, we've got to do something about that. So being able to measure that cycle time was extremely useful. And that's when we started moving into like, um, a Git-based workflow rather than SVN. Not for normal SVN, it just didn't suit the purposes of the distributed team. And uh, we changed the extremely how we work on that. And then last one, which is probably the most important, measure your conversion rates for everything. Think of page views to registrations. Think of registrations to buy in. Think of page views to application downloads and so on. If you can grab all of those things, it's extremely important that you can understand the health of your system. So does that mean measure everything? I used to believe that you should measure everything. No, I do not. I ran a metrics cluster. Um, it was Elasticsearch and Grafana and Kafka based, and it was like uh, 15 terabytes of data in it per week. Okay, just because we were like, oh, let's measure everything and throw it in. Looking back on it, if I could measure 10% of that amount, it would be much more beneficial and much more usable because at that point, 15 terabytes was far too much to go through. Up until very recently, this company I was working for, I was working on a brand new cloud, a brand new cloud provider, okay? It's a story in itself for over beers, but that's okay. But the progress of the team is being reported to senior management, okay, by not my manager, but the manager above, based on the stupid metrics like the number of PRs merged per day, okay? The number of builds per day, because that was seen as changes going into master. Okay, they, of course, pull requests never build, right? And you never have to like, force a change in a pull request because somebody has made a code review change. And then the last one, which was the stupidest one, the number of commits per day. They were able to tell me that for three weeks in a row, I created the most commits per day, and that the next person who was closer than me, on a, day, a time I took four days off, they said, oh, they overtook you today on commits per day. Like, honestly, okay? Commits per day for me is rubbish because when I send a pull request, I rebase it into a single commit anyway. Like 500 commits in a pull request goes into one because it's much more meaningful then rather than anything else. It's just the way I work. I soon realized, and this is the whole reason I do this talk now, is that putting numbers in front of people, people will pull the stupid numbers that makes them feel good, unfortunately. People will want to inflate their egos. 
people will want to show that the teams that they have working for them are awesome and they're delivering as much as they say that they are. And they will pull out the types of metrics in order to do that. They get too emotionally attached to this and that's a crazy important thing. So in summary, there's two types of metrics. Okay, we've talked a lot about the vanity metrics, but we mentioned other metric types and they're called actionable metrics. Okay, vanity metrics, sorry for swearing, Vanity metrics means nobody has a fucking clue where the metric has come from and what it means. Okay, literally they don't have a clue. Okay, actionable metrics is there's a clear understanding of when it happened and why it happened. Think of scientists. Scientists don't just like do an experiment once and that's it. And their, their metrics, they're like, oh, we got that metric. They do it again and again and again in order to prove that they get the same actionable results. The fact that they do that again and again means that they understand why it's happening and therefore they can uh, react based on that. Okay, don't let yourself get fooled based on that. Let's care less about our vanity metrics and more about our actionable metrics because if we do that, we will be able to create better products for our users and the continued use of vanity metrics is extremely damaging for ourselves and also the health of the company. I'm already over time. You can tweet me. I'm definitely like up for talking more about this type of stuff because it's a big passion of mine. But enjoy the last closing keynote, and uh, we'll have a beer later. Thanks.